We're gonna go over how tennis players can hit harder, and we're gonna start right now. So recently, Bayjet and Colomar came out with a study, and it's titled, Joint Specific Post-Activation Potentiation Enhances Serve Velocity in Young Tennis Players. So first of all, what does that mean? When we look at post-activation potentiation, what that means is that if we do a specific style of movement, do we see a greater rate in neuromuscular coordination after that exercise is done? Okay, so is there some type of test or movement pattern that we can do that will elicit a greater response with recruitment of high threshold motor units or anything along those lines, which in turn will lead to another movement pattern that can be applied at a higher degree. Okay, so in this case, they were studying what can young tennis players do to increase service velocity or service accuracy. Okay, and they were gonna use a post-activation potentiation exercise. Now, the research was done on 16 different tennis players. And one thing I will say about this is that they use eight females and eight males. In the results, when we go over it, they don't specify gender-based. I really would wanna see if the men or the women respond better or worse to the post-activation potentiation exercise. They don't specify that, which sort of sucks, but they would have that data, so it would be interesting to, to sort of figure that out. But another interesting fact was the average age was 17 years old, and the average age, so it's 17 years old, plus or minus 1.1 years. So anywhere between you know, 16 to 18 years on average is where these athletes were and remember it was 16 of them the absolute wild part was that they had on average nine years of training in the sport of tennis so if we look at it that the average age was 17 years old and they had nine years these kids were starting their tennis training when they were eight okay so that's pretty freaking young and then probably most of them were starting to specialize you know they have all their parents probably think they're going to be the next serena williams or the next roger federer i'm sure that's a major factor in tennis just like it is in every other sport so let's get into what actually happened and what they researched and what was going on when they were analyzing that post activation potentiation and what it did for service velocity and service accuracy okay so this takes us into the actual protocol so what the researchers did they took these individuals they had them do four sets of eight serves, okay? And the only serves that counted were the in serves. So they had to be fair serves, okay? And then during that time, the in serves would be measured and they would have an actual average of the top ball speed, okay? So when they would hit it, if it landed in and it was a fair service, then they would measure that and then they would add that up. So let's say they had 10 fair serves, they would average out that top speed and then that would be the result. The other issue that they would do then was, okay, the percentage of actual successful serves and see if there was an implication based off of post-activation potentiation and service accuracy. Okay, so we're looking at accuracy, we're looking at ball speed and we're gonna analyze that and compare it. And so that takes us to the specific exercises that they were using for that post-activation potentiation. And they started to say, we know that tennis players are in this overhand position okay we know the joint we know shoulder flexion we know internal rotation has a major impact let's isolate those patterns shoulder internal rotation shoulder flexion okay so shoulder flexion here let's analyze that with a very unique simple to do movement a movement that you could do at the court whenever you're actually going to practice and whenever you might be doing something even potentially inside of a game okay or inside of a match so the first exercise was shoulder internal rotation with a band or a like a chain attached to a cage here and they would sit and they would turn okay so they would do a maximal voluntary isometric contraction so the as hard as you can do that for 10 seconds they would rest and then they would do that again they also did that in a comparison where they only did one set okay so they did one set and then they would do their serves then another one where they did two sets and then they did, took their serves so that was the shoulder internal rotation then they did shoulder flexion where they do the exact same thing as hard as you can hold right here 10 seconds they did two sets they did one set and then they compared the results and then they combined them also when you did shoulder internal rotation with that shoulder flexion and what were the outcomes okay so remember we're measuring ball speed we're measuring accuracy how consistent are they actually getting the ball into the proper box okay and then finally they were constantly being told to hit 
as hard as possible. Okay, hit this at your maximum speed. This takes us to the interesting part behind the results. I think as a tennis coach, I'm not a tennis coach, but I would imagine that tennis coaches have specific ways that they might teach service. Okay, they might say, hit this really, really hard. They might say, hit this really, really accurate. There might be a little bit of a gray area as well. And so from a coaching perspective, just telling them to hit it as hard as possible could potentially get one specific result and not the other just based off of that verbal cue. So we've just gotta be aware of that as far as the coaching world is concerned. What they ended up seeing was that when they did just one set of that shoulder internal rotation at 10 seconds of maximal isometric contraction, they saw no improvement in the actual service speed or service accuracy. Now, what they did see is when they did two sets of the isometric contraction, okay, two sets of it, they actually saw an improvement in service velocity. Same thing when they did the shoulder flexion and they held that when they did one set, they did not see that post activation potentiation have any impact. When they did two sets, they saw that there was an impact on that shoulder potentiation on the on the ability to service at a faster speed. The other aspect that they measured was what was happening within about a minute after they did the activation. Okay, what was that service speed and the service accuracy? Then they measured again at five minutes, at 10 minutes, and at 15 minutes. And they did not see an improvement that was statistically significant outside of that first test. You know, at five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they didn't see much of an improvement. But for that first test, they saw a statistically significant improvement in their overall overall service velocity. So what does this mean? What does this mean, one, for strength coaches? What does this mean, two, if you're a tennis player and you're watching this video and you're going, okay, cool, how can I actually apply this? I think as a, as a tennis coach, what you could do is if you have athletes that they don't serve really well, they don't serve very hard at least, maybe they're very, very precise, but they don't have any juice behind the ball, we could start to use something like this to try to elicit a greater response. Okay, to try to get them to hit a bit harder. Another thing that you could do is you could even use this as tests inside of training. And I don't know the exact rules during a tennis competition, if you could sort of go over and hit a couple shoulder internal rotation isometric actions if you're starting to feel a little bit sluggish because there wasn't much of a, of a fatigue issue when they were doing these tests. So I would think that that would be a really, really interesting thing to play around with if you have a tennis coach who's willing to sort of push the, the mold of what that means inside of the realm of the actual game. Now, for a strength coach, okay, I think there's a couple big factors here. I've dealt with a couple tennis players and I believe tennis players are ungodly athletic, okay? Extraordinarily fast, like very, very fast, very, very agile. The most, probably the most agile athletes out on the planet, you know, compare them to basketball players, compare them to like linebackers and running backs. I would say they're extraordinarily agile. However, I've also realized they don't really like to resistance-based train. So one thing that I would want to see is, you know, take this study and you say, okay, over this time frame, you know, this post-activation potentiation, what happens with their service velocity? What happens if we see a 12-week increase in back squat or, or hurdle hop ability, you know, vertical jump ability, power clean ability? What happens then with their service velocity? Are we able to get them a bit stronger? Are we able to get them to be a bit more explosive? And I like to think about someone like Serena Williams. The reason why, in my mind, she could serve faster than anyone else, one, the technical aspect. She was a phenomenal technician, but two, she had more muscle mass. So if you're a female tennis player and you have a bit more muscle mass, you're gonna be able to hit a little bit harder, especially specific to that joint, based off of this test result. So I would like to see that applied. I also do think that as a tennis strength coach, what you can do then is also look at the joint specific movement, so shoulder flexion. You know, that would be like a, you know, if we look at swimmers or even looking at gymnasts, like a front lever is an extraordinarily challenging shoulder flexion movement. That's a movement that a lot of kayakers use, canoers use that. So it's sort of looking at that shoulder flexion had a big impact on service speed. Let's try to train that in some degree and prioritize that as the technical coordination movement. Okay, the other aspect would be, okay, shoulder internal rotation. All right, well, let's train shoulder external rotation and shoulder internal rotation. Try to train that heavy, light, fast, slow, in different degrees to try to really target that joint region to lead to hitting harder. 
Okay, so at the end of the day, post-activation potentiation does indeed work for service velocity. It doesn't improve service accuracy. That's actually where the technical coach for the tennis players needs to come into play. And I think that this is research that we could be using for pickleball, for badminton, for all of these other highlight, other sports that have that distal object. I think that we could use this and even probably swimming to a point for sprinters, sprint swimmers. I think that this could show us there's probably some type of direct application that we could take. I was even thinking about when I was reading this research, thinking about the pole vault as well and looking at what type of reaction that we're gonna get in those specific positions. So get creative, play around with the test. You have that shoulder internal rotation, two sets, 10 seconds, maximal isometric contraction, or that shoulder flexion here, two sets as well. See if you notice that your service is a little bit harder. If you guys need help with your training, you need help with your program, you don't know what to do with your resistance-based training, you can head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store, and you can download our app, Peak Strength, where we focus on a program specific to you as a tennis player. And you can download this for seven free days of training. During that seven free days, you can cancel at any time, but the worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get five free workouts. At some point, you have to begin your journey to attain peak strength, because remember, freaks, if you wanna become a champion, you've always gotta cultivate your power. Peace.